Hello and welcome to People's Dispatch. I am Viarun Kumar and today we are going to talk about the role of visual communication, the role of creative posters, agitation propaganda posters in popular struggles and working class struggles across the world. We are going to look into the history of it and what lies ahead. To talk more about this, we are joined by Tinks, who is a visual designer with Tricontal Institute of Social Research. Uh, Tinks, welcome to People's Dispatch. Thank you for having me. So, Tinks, to start with um, Tricontal Social Research, Tricon, uh, recently came up with a dossier uh, looking into the uh, visual communication and popular struggles, especially talking about the OSPAL posters. Which, which contributed uh, a lot to the global struggles, uh, the anti-imperialist, anti-colonial struggles across the world. Uh, can you talk more about this dossier and the work which uh, you have done in that? Okay, so maybe um, just a slight step back um, about where this dossier is coming from, uh, and that is related to also where the Tricontinental Institute um, for Social Research is coming from, is from its very name, Speaking back to this history um, of a conference that occurred in 1966 in Cuba, trying to unite the tri-continent, so the, the Latin America, Asia, and Africa, and its anti-colonial struggles. Um, one of the things that emerged out of this was the tri-continental uh, magazine, um, including the, there's also the bulletin, which was more news-oriented. But the, the, the dossier that we're focusing on um, looks a little bit at the visual production, not only of the magazine, but of the poster productions of the OSPAL, which is the Organization of Solidarity with the People of Asia, Africa, and Latin America. Um, and for anyone who's ever had the opportunity to, you know, hold a copy of this Tricontinental magazine that was, um, you know, analysis, uh, some theoretical texts, some, um, um, some exchanges between the anti colonial struggles across the global south. Um, there's something that I think is very um, immediate about why these magazines are important. Um, you look at uh, the quality of its publication, you look at the visuals um, that are uh, diverse in various styles, not so much traditional to the kind of socialist, communist, um, um, what was hegemonic in the, in the visuals of the time. Um, and also you look at the poster production inside, so there's a little uh, folded piece of a uh, poster that is in every issue. And you start asking some questions about how was this produced and for what purposes it was produced and who was producing it. And especially one of the points that uh, the OSPAL posters used to go across the world to various struggles and it used to inspire and the OSPAL posters were themselves inspired by these struggles. Exactly. So mo many of these were internationalists in nature, uh, responding to the needs and the struggles of the time, but they reached a, a circulation of 50,000 copies per issue. Um, so these were going to countries all over the world. Um, and we have to understand in the moment that uh, Cuba, where this publication is being produced, was under embargo and has been since then. Um, so in terms of material constraints, or including paper, um, something to think about, the kind of material conditions of producing um, these actual posters and publications is uh, severely restricted. Almost all the paper is imported into Cuba, for instance. So to get this kind of volume and have that kind of political commitment to uh, share internationalist news um, and, 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 and art from people's struggles is an immense, um, I think, inspiration. Um, and at the same time, you know, with with uh, uh, one of the artists from um, from Ospal, there are many many different kinds of artists that joined the struggle. Um, was saying that the the Tricontinental uh, magazine and the poster became um, a way for the Cuban message and the uh, ideological program to be spread around the world where uh, Cubans couldn't go, where diplomats and militants couldn't go. So many of these posters and publications became the voice of the Cuban Revolution. Uh, one point which is interesting about OSPAL is that many of the founding members of OSPAL or the um, artists who joined OSPAL were actually people who were engaged in advertisement business, uh, as, who were working in the advertisement business in the United States. And they had 
use the advertising techniques in their OSPAL posters. So this is something which you want to elaborate a bit. Yeah, so I think this was one of the big revelations doing this research, um, is that it's not um, kind of accidental or something essentially Cuban in the form of the production, but very much speaks to its time. So we're talking about um, in the 1940s and 50s, Cuba had already been um, a bit of a darling, let's say, of um, U.S. capital. So a lot of the pushing of multinational, uh, co the corporations in Latin America, but particularly in Cuba, but also in terms of the control of the media landscape. So a lot of, you know, what we know about today in terms of advertising, um, like market research, you know, testing products on people, how to see how consumer feedback. These things are very much tested in the laboratory of Cuba and on the Cuban people. So in, there was a very developed um, means of communication um, that pretty much overnight in 1959 um, was taken into the revolutionary project. And this includes a lot of people who were actually trained in the belly of the beast, let's say, through the advertising schools, worked through the ad advertising agencies, and took those skills and kind of turned it against empire itself by contributing to the revolution. So when you look at some of the quality and you study some of the, uh, the, some of the quality of the posters and um, and the kind of carefulness and sophistication in terms of how much thought went to it, you can see how some of these particular strategies are kind of used towards the revolutionary cause, which is very fascinating. And I think it, it kind of begs the question for many of us who do um, visual work on the side of social movements with and for uh, people's struggles, is what are the skills we need today and how do we turn them towards advancing um, people's struggles? Uh, because we also live in, a, in, a, in an age where there's a lot of particular expertise around visual knowledge, around technology, around how things are produced that we need to harness and turn them against empire itself. There's the saying goes which is that communication is not just about information. It's not just about informing people. It's also about inspiring people. So we see that uh, uh, during that era of um, what you call as uh, the Cold War era or the st where there were the numbers, there were numbers of anti-imperialist and anti-colonial struggle. We see various kind of visual communication by popular struggles, whether it's the, it's the agitational propaganda posters from Soviet Union or OSPAL. Uh, we see that there is a kind of inspiration which these posters bring in. Uh, but at the same time, uh, which you, you also talk uh, in your dossier, is that both Soviet Union posters and uh, the OSPAL posters had some differences uh, in terms of its visual style. Uh, can you talk more on that? Um, yeah, so I think it's um, uh, exactly what you said. What was the kind of dominant hegemonic socialist imagery of the time was what was called socialist realism. Um, that you see in, in some of the Chinese and Soviet examples that were usually painted in a much more realistic style. Um, uh, uh, many things around, you know, the, the proletariat, factory workers, the peasantry, and really ennobling, let's say, um, uh, who are the protagonists uh, of the revolutionary classes. Um, the, you look at the Cuban experience, you don't see that. You don't see the, the traditional factory workers uh, you don't see the, the kind of uh, blood, sweat, and tears of, of the, the, the peasants in the imagery themselves. Um, I don't think it's a necessary, I mean, we'll say Che Guevara, for instance, had a strong condemnation, and so did Fidel, um, around what they would call a realism at all costs, because they thought that that would be constraining uh, the possibility and the imagination of a revolution that was um, um, taking place. And, and Che Guevara had a really beautiful quote saying that um, the socialist realism, and I, I have it here, would be putting a straitjacket on the artistic expression of the people who are being born and in the process of making themselves. So there was an openness in the Cuban experience um, to have artists explore styles um, and, uh, and new forms um, that actually both artists didn't have um, the privilege of doing in the commercial art world in working under the, the, the multinational advertising agencies nor in the socialist tradition. So uh, new forms are really 
being elaborated. So when you look at the styles, there's what was current at the time in terms of more commercial art. You have, um, you know, like uh, psychedelic art. Uh, but then next to that, you will also have some sort of pre-colonial iconography, you know, or looking at um, some of the African iconography and and trying to bring new forms because this revolution was not only in its stages of becoming, um, but it needed to also take from the many, many, many traditions and histories we come from to create new forms. So I think there is something that is, you can feel looking at the poster um, because of a, a, even a newness 60 years down the line, um, especially for those who, who make um, make posters, make art, and you think, wow, imagine having that kind of, uh, kind of openness to explore forms, make mistakes, um, in the face of uh, extreme constraints and extreme repression um, and, and attacks by empire from all sides. So this is really fascinating and inspiring history to learn from for what we can, we can do today. Uh, to talk more on the visual communication, we see that now we are in a digital world uh, where digital platforms are growing, people are more into digital uh, modes of communication. Uh, one thing which we have seen in last 20-30 years is that somewhere the movements uh, across the world, uh, their investment in creating uh, visual posters, creative visual posters, inspiring visual posters, has somewhere reached a stagnation. Do you agree on this, or do you think that there is, there is still kind of uh, ospal or the uh, socialist realism kind of post socialist realism kind of posters are st still uh, being created, or new forms are being created among the movements? I would say uh, absolutely. There's a kind of space I think that has um, been given up. Um, in terms of what is the fight of the visual over the visual um, in the battle of ideas. I know that we live in an age where we are inundated with visuals. And in a way, um, probably visual literacy is higher in many senses in terms of people's expectations of the quality uh, just because of this inundation. But in the midst of that, where, where, where the ideology is or where the political project is, is unclear, and I think it's a space. This this dossier is also a bit of a provocation of how we can enter um, that battle um, and not not give up the, the face the space of the visual, um, because we have. This is certainly, for instance, I'll use this example of the dossier. This is certainly a study of where we come from to understand a little bit about how what were the processes, what what inspired this kind of production. But it's not necessarily just remaining in a romantic we must do as the Cubans did, you know. Um, but for us, it's a challenge to think, how do we um, engage in this struggle today? The tools might look different. I mean, maybe not, not every struggle is on the, the street, streets, street posts of what poster it is. It's maybe more on the phones and the computers in many parts of the world now. Um, but where where is the, um, I guess, the... Uh, kind of ideological belief that this is a worthwhile area for our struggles. And how do we also um, bring, bring back a lot of these people who are skilled as artists or designers, self-trained or not, and bring them to the side of the people's struggles um, and, and contribute their skills to, to people's movements? I mean, I think it's a question, and it's an open one, that this dossier is trying to provoke, and I think tricontinental and our um, network of designers and artists that we're trying to develop is also trying to invite um, what could that look like for us today? Um, what kinds of forms of organization would we need to do? How do we exchange um, um, our, our strategies and, and ideas? I think the challenge is also uh, reflected when we see that in last 20, 30 years, how the capitalist industry has uh, made propaganda as something which is negative but its own advertisement comes as something which is positive but what it does is the same the propaganda the advertisement does the same but the how the whole capitalist world has been successful through visual communication in changing the narrative and saying that mm -hmm. the capitalist idea of uh, advertisement is positive so i think this mm -hmm. is this this whole debate is also being reflected here yeah. 
Exactly. And I think, I mean, especially for those engaging in the English language to reclaim the word propaganda might be a good <laughs> good. Uh, yeah. good first step of saying, I mean, it is about exactly as you said, it's about engaging in a field of ideas and, and, and engaging in that battle and, and, and a battle of the narrative and what is the idea and the project and what is possible. Um, so call it advertising, call it propaganda, call it, um, you know, inspirational art or whatever you want to, but the, 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 what, the objective should be the same. Um, and I think one of the things that uh, is great about, you know, projects like People's Dispatch um, is one of the things I learned about the Cuban experience is the contact that a lot of these artists had directly with people's struggles, because it is not an abstract solidarity. And we can talk about internationals is not an abstract idea. It's an action. It's a verb. It's in practice. Um, and I'll give one example of um, the head of the, of the propaganda department, uh, René Medeiros, um, he was sent at some point uh, during the Vietnam War for months to march alongside um, the revolutionaries on the Ho Chi Minh Trail, so really toiling with the soldiers uh, on the paths. And he came back with a series of beautiful um, and paintings about what was the people's struggle on the ground. That kind of militancy and commitment and, and discipline um, we should think of, you know, artists in that way and how, how that kind of contact with people's struggles. Maybe we don't all have to march for months on the ground, in the field, but that direct contact with people's struggles through, um, and through avenues like, you know, people's dispatch, they're connecting us to the ground. Is that vitally important? Because there are projects that are being in the process of becoming, as Jay was saying. So things to uh, end this uh, discussion. Let's look into the OSPAL posters again and the Tricontinental dossier. Can you bring out some of the examples which you really think uh, are close to you, has really inspired you uh, while doing this research? I think one of the things that, um, as someone who's been making, you know, posters and, and kind of designs for various kinds of movements for some time now, um, what was really inspiring was learning about the process um, and the seriousness um, that these artists, in in collaboration with the Communist Party that they were um, taking direction from, in connection with um, different kinds of liberation struggles, like I had mentioned, um, and the kinds of exchanges around ideas and representations that existed is really fascinating. And it's a, a kind of model and inspiration for us to think about today and how to bring back to our movements and and regain that kind of seriousness in production of posters. Um, why is this symbol uh, something we are fighting over? Why this color? Why these fonts? Why do these things reach to people? How do these communicate our ideology or our message or our program? Um, that kind of exchange and, and is, is fascinating and exciting, especially when we think about the accelerated pace that production exists now. We have a lot more tools. Most people um, can be designers with, uh, with a, you know, a simple cell phone in their hand uh, or a piece of paper and pen. You know, there's, the tools have really advanced and diversified. Um, but trying to create spaces where those conversations have happened, are happening and dialoguing means we create better art that reaches, um, reaches people in terms of their hearts, their minds, and, and the project we are pushing forward. Um, so I think that's more a general example, um, and I hope we can take some of those lessons forward.